Hello and welcome to session eight. Uh, this session of uh, London Roller Derby Ref School, we're going to be talking about some of your, your questions, which is going to include things about microaggressions, um, overtime jams, uh, and some penalties and lead jammer stuff. Um, so yeah, I am a Cluster Schmuck or Dahlia and I'm the head ref of um, London Roller Derby and the person who is usually here but is not here this weekend is uh, Feminist Kildroy who has helped create this and is a ref from uh, Scotland or living in Scotland. Um, we are also super lucky this week again, uh, I don't know if this list is right so I'm really hoping it is, uh, to be uh, joined with some incredible facilitators who are going to help us out. Uh, we have got uh, Kilobyte from London Rock and Rollers, uh, uh, Dread, uh, truly from Rock City Roller Derby and Boston Roller Derby, Jens from uh, Report Roller Derby, Short Circuit from London Roller Derby, MC from Leeds Roller Derby, Rollin Rat from Central City Roller Derby, Chopsaw from Gotham Roller Derby, and Shugs Bunny from Dundee Roller Derby, and Lee from Hellfire Harlots. Um, and yeah, we're just really grateful. So we're going to be do using breakout rooms again this uh, this week, just to let you know. Um, as always, I'm just starting up with framing us uh, as a group. So about a third of the people here are already an official. Um, a third uh, don't know anything at all. They're completely new to roller derby. May never even seen seen a game of roller derby, but would like to be an official and like to learn the rules. Um, and 22.4% um, are a player uh, who plays Royal Derby and they don't want to become an official, but they think learning the rules might help. Similarly, there are over 30, 30 I mean, there are 31, that's what we got, uh, 31 different countries uh, represented um, in this group. And so when I'm talking, I'm talking from a very UK, European perspective, although I've officiated in other places. Um, and so if where you live or officiate, you do just something different, um, please say so, let us know. Don't, don't erase that just because I'm the one who has the, the, the camera on me. So um, over the last few weeks, uh, this has become more and more vague. I don't know why the slide's still in here, but we've covered tons of um, things about different penalties, uh, the pack, the engagement zone. Last week, we spoke about discretion a lot, and actually that will be something that's really important uh, in this week as, as well. Um, and we've spoken about zones that you are able to uh, target and zones you're able to block with. Um, and actually this is the penultimate session of, um, of the ref school. So next week is our final session. Um, and we've also just kind of let you know, we set up a website which have all the resources and tools on it. There's also a, a Facebook group that you can join if you'd like as well. Um, but just in case you just kind of want all the resources in one place, they are there. So, uh, this week we are going to be talking about lots of different things. Some of these things will have scenarios um, and some of them won't. Some of them will just be discussion based. Before I start, can I just check, is the noise from outside being a distraction? I might just quickly, I mean, this is the fun thing about Zoom, um, shut the door. Um, so, um, this first bit is called microaggressions, discrimination, and roller derby. Uh, we had some questions about this, and this is also a topic that we have spoken about before. Um, as always, if you write bits in the, the chat, um, we have two mods, Holtz and Short Circuit, who are kind of putting them through to me, but I'm not keeping a, a direct eye on it all the time. The first thing I want to do is actually talk about what a microaggression is, because I think sometimes we use language that makes us sound like we know things, but then isn't actually in any way accessible or understandable. Um, so a microaggression is a brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory or negative prejudicial slights and insults towards any group, particularly culturally marginalized groups. Um, it says a commonplace daily verbal behavioral. I think when we think about behavior, I just want to make sure that people know that it's, like, it's also an action. It's not only kind of words. Um, it can manifest in lots of different ways. Um, an analogy that I use when um, some of my work involves talking about microaggressions is I use the analogy around kind of a mosquito bite. And the fact that one mosquito bite, maybe it's bearable, maybe it's not, maybe you have an allergy, but like you can kind of cope. You get two or three and you're like, oh, this is, this is agitating. I'm getting more agitated, I just want to scratch. Then you get a hundred mosquito bites and you just want to kind of rip your skin off. Um, and therefore 
even though that kind of final mosquito may not have thought, oh, you know, just a regular bite. Um, I mean, it's still a bite, right? Let's not take away from that just because one might be slightly bearable. But also when thinking about like the impact it has on that individual and when it's thinking about like the way in which individuals react from microaggressions, it's not about whether what you did was a microaggression. It's about the fact that it happened to begin with. Um, so the thing I'm going to talk about and we had specific questions around was the WFTDA uh, clarification on how to handle issues around skater colors and numbers, which was uh, issued in July 2019. Um, and specifically what we're talking about here is when um, a skater of color is issued a call based on the color of their skin, not the color of their shirt, um, which, which happens uh, more regularly than it should. Um, and I'm going to go through the policy. At many times when I talk about this, the thing to be aware of is that I'm going to say, read the policy. Um, it is three pages long. It's bullet pointed. It's pretty accessible, I think. Um, and I am not going to tell you every, every little detail of it. Um, because I want you to read the policy. <laughs> I want you to do the work. Um, but we've had questions and this is an educational space. And so I'm gonna go through it, but please read the policy. So your first concern should be about the emotional and physical well-being of the participant. As an official, if you make that call, um, that should be your primary concern. And actually a quote that we've taken out from the policy is, it is inappropriate for officials to provide incidental reasoning as to why their cue was incorrectly issued. The reason an official believes they issued the call incorrectly is irrelevant to the damage they have caused. Doing so calls more attention to an official's proclaimed innocence of bias than the ownership of their microaggression. That's really important. If that's the only thing you take away from this, which I hope it isn't, it's not to make excuses, it's not to make justifications. Okay, they're irrelevant in this moment and probably in future moments too. Then, directly apologize unless you've been told otherwise in your officials meeting. It's possible for a, in the officials meeting for the captain to say, we've spoken to our team, our skate, the skaters of color in our team, and actually we'd prefer you talk to the captain and not engage with any players if this happens. At that point, that's fine, but otherwise apologize immediately to that skater and do not expect or force someone to accept your apology or even acknowledge you've apologized. It's not the time, it's not the place. Their priority is probably trying to play roller derby and get over the experience they're having. And that may not actually even be possible for them at that moment, but acknowledging your apology is not their priority or it may not be. So please don't wait for that. For other participants, the expectation is that if you witness that happening and you feel like it hasn't, you haven't seen it being dealt with, talk to the head officials, right? And that's for anyone in that space. That's for the announcers, the NSOs, the other team. If you feel like it hasn't, you haven't seen kind of within one jam something happening, dealing with that, go and speak to the head official. Um, and it's worth going to the head official because they will be holding a lot of that information rather than that skater themselves, which may not always be the most appropriate. Obviously, if you're on their team and you've seen they're upset, do what you think is best. Um, the expectation of the head official is to talk to your crew if um, any concerns are raised. I also really specifically mention this policy in my officials meeting to remind people about the policies, the procedures, and really remind people like the expectations on officials to take this seriously and to not center themselves because it isn't about us making that call in that moment. And then make sure you check in with the team. So as a head official, you want to make sure you go and check in uh, with the teams. You can do that after the game. You can do that uh, during a halftime if that happens. Something that I found is that if I go and speak to any of the bench crew and I say this incident happened, like how is everyone? Some of the bench crews may not even be aware it happened. And then they feel like I have given them like a direction to go and speak to that skater. And I've now begun to say, please check in with that skater if and when it's appropriate, not in this moment, because it may not be the best moment for that skater to suddenly have their bench coach be like, this thing happened and how are you and blah, blah, blah. Like, once again, this is really about centering the skater and how they are feeling and how they are doing. For other officials, um, if you see someone make an incorrect cue in real time, correct it. So if you can hear that, like a penalty is going on and you can hear someone miss um, uh, saying the incorrect cue, um, 
then correct it if you have seen that any insubordination has been given because like the the official who's calling the penalty hasn't realized they've made that mistake make sure that has been removed the initial penalty should still stand um and if you feel like you've heard something go and talk to that official talk to other officials if someone doesn't act right they fail to understand or acknowledge the the damage um that, that has been caused that is grounds for being removed from a game or an event like in this this policy it starts by saying i'm just going to read it um the wfta recognizes that officials are humans and make mistakes however any action that results in a skater of color being issued an improper cue based on the color of their skin will not be tolerated so there is education that we should be doing and being able to apologize and understand that and work on that and take a second before you make a call is really important but if someone is just unable to acknowledge that um then that is grounds for removal and actually if it's happening continuously then that can also like if it's in a tournament situation that can also be grounds for removal um and as it says the determination process should always happen collaboratively with the captains of each team at a time appropriate for them to hold the discussion and then I've written in kind of make sure you know and understand your league's grievance policies. They're really important and it may not get to the point of using it, but it's really important to understand them. Um, so in summary, um, apologize to the skater, expect no response back and make no excuses. Acknowledge that it takes an emotional and physical impact on that skater. If you call an insubordination, remove that. If you hear another official make this incorrect, you check with them and make sure you tell the head official that this happens. Um, at London Roller Derby, we have started piloting actually around November last year. Um, we have a lot of people officiating for us, like uh, skaters officiating. They come in and out during jams and everything else. So actually what we'd started doing is, is basically saying these bullet points and like a kind of a 30 second version at the beginning of every scrim, because we scrim quite a lot, um, making sure that anyone who's officiating, whether you are a skater who is officiating for 10 minutes or a, an official who is kind of more dedicated to, to learning the process, understands this and actually sometimes if we know that people are going to be going in and out we will literally stop scrim and say it loudly so everyone can hear uh with the reason we piloted it rather than just going like this is what we're doing is because number one we wanted to make sure that we could trial something and often if you mention something more it happens more we've actually found the opposite we now have a recording system where we record if this happens and write down kind of a few different notes um and we haven't had an incident of it being recorded um but also it we wanted to make sure that skaters of color didn't feel like they were somehow being like overly highlighted by us us trialing this so uh we still haven't kind of found out the exact kind of outcome of the pilot because uh there isn't roller derby um and we wanted it to go on for a, a, a bit longer um but that's something that we are trialing to try and kind of really reinforce this and make sure that um harm happening in scrims is as harmful as harm happening in games and and remembering that this isn't just a kind of a games policy some other kind of common microaggressions to be aware of and actually if people are writing any more in the comments or anything like i would very much want to share them to kind of raise awareness um, and this often happens around kind of uh, transphobia trans misogyny and also racism and particularly with actually with black skaters around accusations of being aggressive um, or reckless um and like a, a hard hit from a black skater um and a trans skater um being deemed illegal compared to uh, white skaters um there are a lot of folks black skaters saying that they feel that there is an overcalling and actually the thing i would say around that is um record like we record our penalties for a reason um, and if you're in a tournament situation as well, you'll have other officials watching and keep an eye out for that. Um, it's, it's, it's important to, to understand that our biases just don't go away just because we think we're being nice people. Like it takes real effort and energy um, and time. Um, and if that's something that's being raised to us, we should be taking it seriously. Um, Tem and I actually were talking about the fact that if you've, you've been told that overcalling is happening, um, things that you can do, right? I'm trying to make this as practical as I can. Um, in some ways, isn't to apologize unless you've seen it happen. And the reason I say that is because I don't want us using fake words. Saying I'm sorry and not meaning it is pointless. But actually what you can say is, thank you for telling me. I will take this seriously. And I will go and talk to other officials so that we can keep an eye out for it more. You shouldn't, you should believe it's happening, right? And um, 
by going to speak to a tournament head who will have the stats in front of them and have a different cameras. That's a way of trying to keep an eye out for it and keeping an eye on seeing whether you think those calls are fair to then have conversations about changing e equilibriums of calls and things like that. And then also um, moving on is, is misgendering, um, which can happen to lots of skaters um, with lots of different ways, which is why often using more neutral language um, can be really helpful um, to prevent that harm, saying, you know, skater 213 did this. Um, and and I think that gets more complicated when uh, you're dealing with lots of different languages. Um, so as a head ref, I've often really tried to make sure that we do official reviews really slowly so that if someone is speaking uh, English as a second, third, fourth language, that they have the time to kind of really try and work out what that gender neutral language might be. Um, and then also uh, just encouraging that more thoughtfulness on the track, right? When you're like, I've, you know, I've got her. And you're like, no, you don't know that person let's use that language and think about what we're doing right in that in that moment. So yeah, um, as I kind of said, I got ahead of myself. Um, if a microaggression is raised, acknowledge what the skater said and take it seriously. Don't make any excuses or justifying comments. Don't start saying, oh, you know, but I, you know, I just saw you do this though. That's not helpful. It's not taking it seriously and it's centering yourself. Um, talk to the appropriate people. For example, if you're at a tournament um, and a skater of color says they've been overcalled, talk to the tournament heads. They can track the stats, they can watch the feed. Um, it's important to take this seriously. If all we ever do is make excuses for ourselves, nothing will get better um, and we won't be making this a safer space for anyone. Um, discrimination. This is, I'm, I mean, I'm do trying to do this all in like 10 minutes. So this is not like a kind of a 101. This is just trying to go over some of the points that we had, we had covered. Um, if there is explicit or even implicit discrimination, know what your policies and procedures are. It can sound really bureaucratic. It can sound really rubbish. It can sound like this is a waste of time. Someone really explicitly just said this, right? But actually, I believe that having policies and having procedures and then knowing what you will do if something happens, right? That's the important bit, um, is can, what can really help you in a situation. Don't wait for someone to be racist or homophobic or biphobic or transphobic or ableist or xenophobic. Or, don't wait for that. Don't wait to be like, oh, we forgot that like your social media when you're so explicitly linked to our league is really important. And actually that says something about you and therefore we would like you to not be in this community or this is something that's happened and we feel at this moment in time, education and, and work on that way can be really important. Um, so just make sure you know what you're doing in your communities and in your, in your leagues and be proactive about it. So today for this uh, at LRD, we have a lot of work to do. Um, and we've set up a diversity and inclusion committee over the last year. So like I got in touch with them for this and then they're checking in with the league overall. And then the league overall might say, I don't really agree with that. And actually it doesn't mean that the league overall isn't being inclusive or diverse. It means actually the diversity and inclusion committee has to listen to the wider league, right? Like not every trans or, or disabled or skater of color, any other skaters are in our DNI committee, right? So once again, it's really important to try and make sure that you're listening um, and centering appropriate voices. I went over that really quickly. Um, I hope that if you have any questions on it, we will have the time at the end for the, for the half hour um, to, to think about it more. But I really think it's about at this time, particularly thinking about what we can do to be proactive. And like, as a white skater, educating myself is something that I do. Um, and I'm trying to do more. Um, it's also about listening. And it's also about being open minded to the fact that I have racist tendencies and you have to work through that and acknowledge it and in order to make Derby a safer space, right? It's, it's, it's really important. Um, so other things to look at, so in terms of, in terms of WFTDA sources, uh, they have a code of conduct, they have a tournament code of conduct, and they also have the officiating clarification on how to handle issues. And I think they're creating toolkits and, and, and doing some more things. Um, if anyone knows any more, please put it into the comments. Um, but that's kind of that bit. Uh, now changing to something that I think happens less than racism in Roller Derby, overtime jams. Um, we had a question about what an overtime jam is. And so for some folks who do not know what an overtime jam is, we thought a scenario on this would be uh, not, not necessary, but uh, it's worth talking about. It's what happens if there's a tie. Um, so if the game ends in a tie, um, the second period, so the second half, uh, gets extended by at least one additional jam. The overtime jam is like any other jam with two exceptions. No lead jammer is declared. 
Um, both jammers begin scoring on their first trip round through the pack. So each jammer is in a position to let the opposing blockers on their first earned pass. So basically the moment the jam timer blows that whistle to say that jam has started, the jammers are scoring. Um, and that's, that's really important. And then you keep adding jams until it ends without a draw. A junior roller derby can end with a draw, but the, the teams I think can decide if they don't want it to. Uh, but otherwise, no other WFTDA game can end in a draw. Um, they're often very stressful. Uh, they're often uh, unexpected because actually a lot of the time as officials are not really paying a ton of attention to the score. Um, and often they'll be kind of a little bit of an uh, official timeout so the, the teams can be aware that there's going to be an overtime jam and so that also the officials can kind of collect themselves to go this is what we're doing this is what's happening and often if there is an overtime jam the audience is very excited and everyone's very excited so taking that moment to kind of go this is what we're doing um can be really helpful um yeah so we're going getting it to your questions now so there's a few different things around pack definition um, that I wanted to show. So my hope is, is that you'll see this. Can I see this? Yeah, okay. So these are from uh, WTDA YouTube. And there's just three examples that I'm going to play and talk over. This one I've slowed down a bit. Um, so as you can see, the back of the pack is going back. Um, but the, the no jam, the no pack has been called. And no one is really doing anything. The front of the pack is still really moving and the back of the pack really wasn't speeding it up. So as you'll see in a moment, uh, Black75 and another Black teammate, uh, don't know their number, has just been sent off. Both of them have been sent off. One for uh, who was at the back who wasn't speeding up quickly enough and the other for engaging at the front. This one is much quicker, but as you can see here, you'll see Gotham, the team in the Black, bridging, right? They're going one, two, three, and then they go a bit further out. So the pack is at the back, um, but they're doing that in order to try and hold back that jammer. Um, and then this one is just to show a little bit of pack movement. So as you can see, the pack is kind of all, then it goes back, and then it goes back a bit to, the, to everyone as well. Um, so I'm just showing you that to kind of remind you about um, pack definition a little bit, um, because we haven't really spoken about it um, in in a second, to be honest. Um, and yeah, I thought it was worthwhile. I also wrote down the exact definition of pack, the pack definition, which now I can't find, but it's basically um, the proximity, where have I, why have I completely blanked on pack definition? Um, the pack is the largest group, that's it. I'm sorry, I don't know where my brain went. The pack is the largest group of both group who are upright and inbounds uh, blockers containing both teams and they have to be within 10 feet of each other which is why when you saw Gotham kind of going out into a line they were trying to really extend that pack. Um, so we have a scenario um, around pack definition. I'm going to go through the scenario then we're going to go into breakout rooms and then we're going to come back and debrief. Um, I am sorry that I'm speaking quickly. Uh, I've had feedback. Uh, it's a uh, it's not going. I will I will do better. Apologies. So we're going to go through the scenario, and then we are going to go into our breakout rooms, and then we're going to come back and talk about them. So, white pivot, who's here, the one with the blue circle around them, um, is going to go back to help their wall out. So they've got their the white wall there, um, but by doing that, they create a no pack situation, okay? So there was a pack, but now there is no pack. Both the IPRs, so these two refs here, the inside pack refs, um, are calling no pack. White two and black three move forward slightly, but there is still no pack. So as you can see from before, they've moved a little bit, but not that much. So the question is, what happens there? What would you do? And on that note, I'm going to ask uh, Holtz to move us out into breakout rooms, please. We weren't recording, so I am sorry about that. Um, but it was a it was a good analogy about the time it takes to, that was from Kilobyte, the, the time that it takes to uh, 
process all the information you need in order to see a pack and the analogy was about driving a car you learn all these different things about moving the clutch the indicators seeing where all the cars and it takes time and at first you're petrified and then eventually it becomes relatively second nature because your brain is just a bit more accustomed to doing multiple things at one time i hope that was a good enough summary anyways scenario one debrief who would like to talk about it we um, um sorry go ahead go ahead, ahead Lee. Oh, okay. Sure. Um, and we agreed pretty quickly, I think, that uh, a, a penalty would be warranted on, I think it was the white pivot. Um, yeah. we, we had a brief discussion about why is it not a direction penalty? I think we agreed that it would be a, you know, a destruction, uh, a illegal positioning penalty, but why not just direction? Do you want to answer that? No. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Someone else can talk. <laughs> I can answer it. Does anyone else want to answer it? Okay, so for me, and I'm, you know, the reason it's not a direction penalty is because by going in that direction on its own, you don't get a penalty, right? If that would be the same reason that if any time you recycled someone, you got a penalty just for going in that direction, right? So that person hasn't then hit someone. They haven't made a, a, a contact in that way. And direction, I want to say, is a, a contact. Like, often you have to make contact or have an impact in that way. Like, well, the rest are nodding, and I'm really anxious I've got it wrong. Um, but... The reason it is a destruction penalty is because by doing that action and specifically by doing that action in anti-Derby direction, you have very explicitly destroyed the pack by going in and made impact by going in a direction you should not be going in. Um, one more comment on scenario one before we, we move over. Um, we agreed on yeah the penalty on the pivot um, and then for reforming the pack that um, White would need to do more to reform the pack but uh in the scenario with the black blocker number three we're wondering um them moving forward um while white is trying to reform the pack could that have made it more difficult to reform the pack and um i guess should that be penalizable or have some sort of impact in making it more difficult for white to reform the pack in that case since they're not stopped mm. yeah we, we we have the same discussion um, about black three because um, white three actually immediately started to reform the pack although in long term it didn't have the outcome but especially it didn't have the outcome because skater black three also moved in counterclockwise direction and if um, black skater three would have just stayed put where they were um, the pack would have been reformed by the actions of white skater two yeah no exactly and i think uh, something just to add before we move away from this as well it's also about the time and i was saying that um sometimes those who are more in the middle can feel like they've gone forward enough because the front of the pack seems closer to them and they've probably got their arms out i don't know why we're, we're, we're judging it on their hips um and they feel like they have reformed the pack but actually they they haven't and so that's also something that i think those in like kind of the middle area can also struggle with uh, scenario two. So I've made some videos for this. The sound isn't working because as you guess, my tech isn't working great. But let's see if this, I'm going to, I'm going to speak through it. So uh, hopefully you can all see this. Let me know if you can't. Um, okay. So as you can see here, uh, we've got the blue jammer there gets knocked out by the red uh, blocker. Uh, the red blocker has also gone out due to how hard they hit. The blue jammer goes back in, in front of the red blocker. Um, and at the same time, because it's so chaotic, the red jammer has taken off their helmet cover, right? So they're like, oh, there's loads of stuff's happening. I've taken off the helmet cover. Um, and so what we're gonna see then is the blue jammer goes through the pack, ignore the fact that there seems to be some sort of carnage. It was obviously very legal. And then you've seen uh, the red jammer also go through the pack and they both exited the engagement zone. Okay, so that's scenario. The jam starts, the red blocker hits the blue jammer out of bounds. Due to the speed of the hit, the red blocker immediately goes out too. Red jammer is stuck behind a wall of blue blockers. Blue jammer then re enters in front of red blocker, passes all the blockers and leaves uh, all the other blockers and leaves the engagement zone. Red jammer uh, removes their helmet cover, gets around the, the and that's meant to say blue blockers. I've changed the colors of this a few times, sorry, uh, and passes all the skaters and leaves the engagement zone. Okay, so on that note, I'm going to ask uh, 
Holtz to move us back into uh, breakout rooms, please. Debriefing scenario two, who would like to go first? Um, uh, first. Go for it, Ratty. I was going to but you go. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, we went through the scenario of uh, the jammer who got hit out by the blocker. Um, it says, so, mentioned side by side, so it doesn't actually mention um, if they ever passed, but we, we covered within our chat that if they would passed before going out, they would have earned the pass on that skate, skater to earn the ability to get lead, so they would have got lead. But if they hadn't, then by coming in front at that blocker that hit them out, they haven't passed them legally on track, inbounds and upright, therefore couldn't get lead. Yep. KB? Yeah, so we discussed that in that scenario, obviously making the same assumption that Ratty has there, that they didn't pass that blocker um, before they went off the track, uh, that no one would gain lead jammer in that scenario. Okay. Um, just for time, we're going to move forward on from this scenario. Any questions you've got, um, keep keep asking them. Um, so it's going well. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so scenario three, we have got um, the jam's about to start. Red jammer is upright at the jam line, whilst the blue uh, jammer is about 10 feet back. Blue pivot keeps their toe stop ahead of the jam line, but the rest of their body is behind the line with their hips behind the hips of red jammer. The jam timer starts the jam and the rear IPR calls blue pivot on a full start. Blue pivot pauses, raises their hands and yields, staying behind the uh, red jammer the entire time. Red jammer fights through the pack, earning passes on the other seven blockers and is now ahead of the foremost blocker. They continue skating forward and exit the engagement zone from the front. Moments later, blue jammer, having earned a pass on all eight blockers, is ahead of the foremost blocker. So I'm just gonna show you a video of this real quick. And I should also say that the uh, wonderful Ali Cat from LRD helped with all of these videos. So thank you very much. Um, here we have it. So you can see the pack, the jam's about to start. You can see there that the toe stops are on the line, but the rest of the feet are behind. So imagine if one toe stop is further ahead and the hips are behind. Um, the blue pivot uh, has their toe stops, yep, over the line, but the rest of their body is uh, behind the line and the uh, blue jammer is a bit uh, further back. So the IPR calls a full start, the jam started, calls a full start on the blue pivot and the blue pivot does what they do, which is, you know, they put their arms up in the air and say, oh, I'm yielding. The arms up in the air thing, by the way, you don't have to do. But at all this point, they are behind the red jammer. The red jammer then goes forward, passes the other seven blockers and out of the engagement zone. And then you've got the blue uh, jammer who does real similar uh, kind of, you know, excellent uh, movement around and also leaves the pack. So the question is here, who is lead? Um, so uh, at that point, I'm going to ask uh, Holtz to move us out in two breakout rooms, please. So fast. I know. I just I could talk forever about roller derby, and this is not enough time. <laughs> It isn't, it isn't, but we're like, you know, we've got a Zoom call and people's attention spans and all that jazz, but we can also talk about more of these in the Facebook group. So, yeah. Um, scenario three, who wants to talk about it? I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know, uh, I feel like I did most of the talking in my breakout. Um, there is justification for calling either of them lead jammer, um, technically by the rules. Uh, personally, I think I would give, is it Red who got out first? Yeah. Red who got, I would call Red lead jammer and I would not kind of titchy with the rules and be like, oh, they false started, blah, and like let them remain on the track. I would immediately penalize the blue blocker who is deliberately lining up super illegally to try to um, mess with the game um, and using 424 other illegal procedures to kind of justify that. Skaters who violate the rules of the game should be penalized if it has a significant impact on the game. Um, if it's a technical violation, results in advantage, it should be penalized. Uh, choosing to line up in a way that in order to earn a legal pass, a skater is forced to skate clockwise is a technical uh, violation. 
that results in an advantage. And I would just be like, please see yourself to the penalty box. They would earn it legally because that skater was in the penalty box. That's, that, that's all I got. Anyone else want to say a comment? Because I think that's kind of controversial. I mean, yeah. I, oh, sorry. Yep. Well, no, I, I was just going to ask uh, for, for Chop. So would you give a warning to that uh, if, a, and then if that, that behavior happens again, then penalize it, or would you just penalize straight away? Do you see that as out and out from the start on sporting behavior? Um, so I, in general, if I'm in that position where I would be calling that penalty, I'm giving them a warning before the jam about where they're lining up. Um, mind the line. If they're really not paying attention, I'd be like, you're false starting. Um, and then it, when they choose to deliberately stay there, that's a choice. Um, and it, we're here to referee a game, not like the titchy rules of roller derby. And we know teams love to like get in there and kind of play with them and see what advantage they can get. That, um, especially if they get that like, hey, mind the line, that's a deliberate choice to not play the game as it's supposed to be played as like in the spirit of the rules. So yeah, I would just give that penalty and then, you know, I'm sure they would I'd have an official review about it or I'd have an angry coach come to chat for 30 seconds and I would explain that and if they, and then we'd move on from there. And if I keep doing it, then like, yeah, then we, I, then we just keep penalizing. <laughs> it's not the game. Did anyone else have different conversations? Did anyone else get to that conclusion as well? Uh, we talked about whether the the false starting or illegally positioned skater was actually part of the pack uh, and when they're yielding and stuff like that. So are they defined as part of the pack? Um, yeah. Mm, interesting. I think, I think it's interesting because I think... Um, I think both, I think that's a point about discretion, right? When it comes to this kind of scenario, um, starting in a position, complete, like out of position where you're intentionally trying to block the jammer uh, is not sporting conduct, right? It's not part of the game. However, the rules state that actually if part of you is uh, on the track and part of you is, is behind the line, still within the track boundaries, you can give a warning of a full start. Right. And at that point, and I think that the discretion, I think, is kind of chops or says, maybe it would go to an official review. Maybe this is one of those loopholes. Um, and it's about kind of thinking about that. Um, so then giving giving that warning. But at that point, would they be lead jammer? And actually, uh, my, my thinking is they would be lead jammer. And you would think of it maybe as like a not on track point. Right. The, the red jammer never got given the opportunity to pass them legally because uh, they'd been the, the other blocker had been in the wrong position to begin with. Um, we're going to quickly go on to, it's not really a scenario, it's a question. I would love your comments. Uh, we're not going to go into the breakout room because it is four o'clock now and I am aware of that. Um, this is the last thing, this is the last thing and then um, we're going into the kind of Q&A. So all of these things have come from your questions that we, you, you sent in over the last kind of week or two and one of them was, can you official review the outcome of an official review? Uh, so I would really like to know uh, your thoughts in the in the comments and in the chats. Um, no, okay. Uh, and the answers can be, you know, yes, no, maybe, other, it depends. No, that's absurd. The question has some appeal. Sure, but it probably won't help. Sure, but it probably won't help. Um, that's what I'm going to go for. So if we, um, if we even think about kind of this part of the scenario that we had last week um, where there... Um, the jam ref gave lead jammer to the kind of the wrong jammer due to an officiating error because everything happened really chaotically. Uh, and last week we came to a particular conclusion around the discretion we would use when they called an official review about that, around points, around who should have been lead jammer, who should have called it off, around penalties. We discussed that last week. But if we use that scenario and actually the, the a jammer due to officiating error is, is given lead jammer and there's an official review. And in the official review, they go, what we'd like is we'd like more points and we'd like that jammer to be penalized for calling it off illegally, right? So even though, the, and let's say all the officials go and they talk about it and they decide, well, actually that jammer should have been penalized. They weren't the lead jammer. So at that point, um, you can review the outcome of an official review. 
um, as an opposing team, right? So actually if red call, let's say like red team calls an official review, red team calls an official review uh, and says, we want white team's jammer to be penalized. White team could then official review that, but it's usually a bad idea for a few reasons. One is that the head ref when communicating back about an official review should have given enough information that you should know that the officials have said everything they've seen They've discussed every situation, especially if it's a surprising one like that, right? Due to an officiating error, but you're still going to get the penalty for whatever reason. Sometimes officials don't know the rules sometimes, but also don't understand what's happening or they've considered other things. So you can do it. The answer is yes, um, as you're an opposing team. Um, but you want to think about it really carefully. And actually, I think as a head ref, if I were to give a, a result back and I were to get a few questions back, Kind of brief questions from either of the teams i think it's appropriate to answer those if it gets into tons of depth then maybe not but i think you should be able to communicate back the decision you made clearly enough that official reviewing an official review shouldn't be necessary um if you are the team who asked for an official review and you feel like the answer was was not the correct one you can't use in another official review but if you are unhappy with the outcome talk to the officials if you're in a tournament situation, talk to the tournament head refs, talk to the, the crew head refs, understand what's going on, ask them to keep an eye out for things. Um, and if you feel like the crew isn't picking up on stuff, um, there are different ways to kind of communicate about that. Um, but if you are the crew who used, if you are the team who used an official review and you want to official review the outcome of that, you can't do it. If you're the team who hasn't called one but then is unhappy with the outcome you can you can it's up to you to use it. it's your right to use it when you want to in that in that in those in the, between jams um but think really carefully about what you think the outcome might be if officials haven't seen something they can't call it and you should know enough of information after the official review about that um so on that note i hope that made sense thank you for all your questions uh, thank you for being officially awesome and uh, we are going to go into the 30 minutes of questions but the other thing I would like to say um, as always this is a free course and if you'd like to donate to London Roller Derby or any of the food banks around them please do but also um, at this time if you wanted to donate to any of the funds around uh, Breonna Taylor or George Floyd or Tony McCade and there are probably many other uh, black um, African Americans as well who have been murdered uh, by the police or um, Belly uh, Majinda in the UK who um, has had no justice for her death. Um, and there are some other charities that uh, London Roller Derby at the moment is considering. None have been confirmed, but we're um, donating the Jews for all of last month to around Black Minds UK maybe, or Exist Loudly Fund, which is a queer a black youth organization uh, run by Tanya Compass, or not an organization, like it literally just kind of started, uh, or United Friends and Family Campaign to campaign on behalf of families killed in police custody. Uh, so if any of those organizations appeal to you or, or you were already going to be making a donation uh, for this and this week you felt like you wanted to make a donation elsewhere, uh, please do feel free. Um, on that note, um, I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen um, and I am gonna do what we usually do, which is ask you to show some uh, Hand movements, please. So, uh, forearm. How? What's a forearm penalty? Yeah. Bam. Someone said it last week that um, by having to do it in front of your camera, you're actually probably doing it in the right way. So often, like you know, if I was doing it, usually you do it here, but actually, I'm doing it high up because I want my camera to see. And actually, that's how you should do it. Uh, you want it to be clear to the NSOs uh, and the audience and the other officials and the skaters. So doing it higher up is better. Um, direction. What's a direction penalty hand signal? Yes. Bam. Good job. Uh, high block. Yeah. It's like a good, good grab. A legal procedure. Yeah. It's very rare, but it does happen. Um, misconduct. Cool. Um, 
And finally, a legal position. Um, and then a legal contact. I said finally and I lied, sorry. A legal contact. Has my computer crashed again? Possibly. It's hard to know. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna go with yes. So at this point, uh, we are gonna go to the questions uh, that people have had. Um, if you have a question and you would rather speak it than um, you'd rather speak it than write it, please just make a comment and one of the mods will let us know. Um, and then you can answer it verbally. Uh, if you do do that, you will be on screen, just so you're aware of that. So if you are, um, uh, on, um, if you are, um, yeah, if you unmute yourself and talk, you will be on screen. So, uh, questions, what are they today? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. May I say something to hand signals? Please do. Okay, so um, one thing you should think about if you are with doing hand signals very high is you at the same time don't want to block your own view. So you often see officials that want to make large and high hand signals like making them in front of their face and blocking their complete visual of the track for the duration of the hand signal. So you want to watch out for that. You want to make them visible, but you also don't want to block your own view. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that is stuff and it's stuff that you get given feedback on. It's such a good point, um, kind of for a very long time after starting to actually Put this into practice and and next week we'll also be talking more about like the oh derby has started again in some way and, and how do you kind of use all the stuff that we've spoken about so some questions um and i welcome any of the officials who are still on the call to to answer these and uh, and help help out um so going back to scenario one the scenario uh let me just remember remind myself where we had i think the pivot going back to help their buddy um yeah so this is the scenario where white pivot goes back to help their wall and creates a no pack situation and the iprs are the calling no pack uh and then white two and black three move forward slightly but there's still a no pack right let's that that scenario blockers must disengage during a no pack can jammers engage anyone want to talk about no packs and jammer engagement Okay, I will. Um, so, uh, no, if they're already being engaged on, they can kind of, uh, and please do correct me if I'm wrong on this. Um, if they're already being engaged on, they can like kind of engage in that state, but there shouldn't be a consistent engagement. And like, that's why sometimes when there's a no pack, you'll also see jammers getting penalties because like they also shouldn't be doing that. Um, often it is the time when a jammer can kind of skate away because actually they, no one should be enga engaging on them, but they can't just go and like hit someone whilst there's a no pack. Um, so yeah, that's that question. Um, uh, sorry, did, can I just say one thing on that? So the, the jammer can hit the other jammer during an opac. Mm, yes, that's very true and often so fun. Um, and you'll see things when there's no packs and like the engagement between jammers, they can, yeah, they can hit each other, uh, during that time. Um, so, and actually they can, they can engage each other at any point on, on the track. Uh, as well. Um, another one around that same scenario uh, that we might need a visual for this. So does, does that mean if black three, so one of the black three was kind of in the middle, moved forward a little bit, but still didn't actually reform. Um, black three that moved to help their pack. If black three had moved back, causing a no pack, it wouldn't be a destruction as they were moving in Derby direction. No, black three moving back would still have been a no pack, I think. Um, because it probably it potentially would have created a split pack. I'm not entirely certain on the distances, but it, it would it would kind of depend on it. But if you're going in anti derby direction, so if, if um, then it would have been if black three had gone forward, had gone in derby direction, and actually everyone was still within ten feet of each other, that wouldn't have been a, a no pack. It depends, right? It depends on the distances that were happening there. Um, but yeah, if you go forward and create a no pack, if it's gradual and it's in the same pace as everyone else is going, you'll often get a no pack with no penalty. But if you are if you are going forward and you dramatically change your speed and create a no pack, you still would get a penalty for that. 
because actually you have still destroyed a pack. It's just the rules have been clarified that kind of any anti-derby direction that destroys the pack is penalty worthy. Um, and it's a bit more nuanced and confusing if it's kind of a slow gradual going forward and it kind of naturally kind of parts, but everyone's going at the same kind of pace. Um, so sometimes that's why it'll be a bit more subtle. We have a, yeah, dread. Yeah, it's it's important to note here that um, that non-derby direction that's, that destroys the pack, that's penalizable if the pack speed uh, is either stopped or moving in, in derby direction. So if you, if your pack is moving in the non-derby direction, then any, uh, then continued non-derby direction that causes a no pack uh, is not immediately penalizable. So there is a section in the rules here um, that basically says if your pack is moving in the counterclockwise direction or stopped, then uh, non-derby direction uh, uh, destructions will, will be penalized. Yeah, there's also a tactic that some kind of linking onto that uh, that some uh, teams use that I actually saw last year at Continental Cup for the first time, where the moment the jam whistle goes, an entire line goes back and creates a no pack. And the reason you don't give a penalty at that moment is because not because they've created a no pack, but because the speed of the pack has yet to be defined. So it's a really interesting tactic that people have started using to try and think about things in a different way. And obviously, at that point, the moment you call it a no pack. You, they need to reform that that's not different but it's interesting why there isn't a penalty in that direct moment because if they do it quickly enough you don't know the speed of the pack so it's yeah it'll be interesting to see if that gets changed anytime soon um if a team won um an, the official review retained their official review could they then use that or as a timeout immediately yes there is no knowledge about when people can use their timeouts or official reviews. In fact, uh, in that game that we showed, the Victoria versus uh, game, from my memory, just wanted a breather, right? If you're really tired, um, yeah. So uh, it's, it's so hard for me to know if my computer has crashed this, this session. Um, there was an instance of full starting last season, last postseason, um, where the blocker was ahead of the pivot line. Can you speak to how that yield would work with the jammers attempting to pass? There was an instant of full starting last where the blocker was ahead of the pivot line. So at that point, if they're ahead of the pivot line, the jammer most likely will have the opportunity to pass them legally. Um, and yielding isn't about everyone getting past that person. Yielding is about giving an opportunity that you have gained by being in, a, in a, an incorrect position and giving those around you the opportunity to move forward. So I think the reason people put their hands up is because they want to make it really clear they're not moving. But actually what we're looking for is have you stood still and enabled people to go past you, but they don't have to go past you. So for me in that moment, I would say um, that the jammer would have the opportunity to legally pass that person and, and therefore them full starting at the pivot line wouldn't have any impact on that. If anyone else wants to say anything. Yeah, just generally yielding doesn't require the jammer. So yielding doesn't have anything specifically to do with the jammer getting position. It's just giving up the advantage that you, the advantage that you're gaining by being in the illegal position. Does that make sense? It does. It was much clearer. It's about everyone, not just the jammer. It's about whoever's near you. Um, one more question, and then I think there was a question um, from someone out there. Um, I know yielding skaters do not count towards pack, but do they count towards passing slash scoring? Yes. Um, so if for some reason a skater is yielding still and a jammer goes past them, they would get that point. I think that's the question. I'm not sure I've misunderstood the question. Does anyone have anything to add on that? Um, okay. Yeah, that's on that note, um, someone sorry. had a question um, in the chat. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask it, please? Yes. Um, this came up from the last scrim that I refed uh, before lockdown. Um, what happens if 
from both jam refs perspective both jammers have exited the pack on their first attempt and they have equal hips are the, is it just there is no lead jammer um, so i think we have I enough good jam refs who can answer that on here um, Not i guess in in practice uh, that needs to be um, i guess a discussion between the jam refs a pretty quick discussion often um, if they're both passed legally they're both eligible to come lead and it's just really neck and neck it'll just be who i guess whoever cares goes, the most yes, wins my, yeah whoever says yep i'm taking it my jam is lead if there's yeah nothing in it it's just a decision that has to be made in the um, split second and agreed on between the jam refs I think this is some, something that sometimes the front inside pack ref can help with as well. You you may also have a good view of this, and particularly the reason that the jam refs can't determine who's lead is that they were actually a bit out of position. Uh, then hopefully it's front inside you you can communicate who you believe to have lead. And, and the way you do that is often just by shouting, Pink's lead! Pink's lead! Uh, to communicate that if you feel like you've seen that happen and you saw who was out first, that's how you communicate that. Or who, Whatever color, obviously. See, like, if it's really close, it's nearly, um, like, let's say the, the, the chance that this happens, that they really come out at the exact same moment, is near to impossible. Um, it often has to do with gem refs also being not completely in line with gemmers, because while the gemmers can be fairly easily in, kind of in line on the track, it's much harder for the jam refs, so one of them will have a bit of an offset look, while one of them hopefully is really in line, and there comes the front IPR, and he often has a very good view about it as well. And um, if not, the, the decision should be made by the jam ref who has the best point of view, and that means the jam ref who is the most like in line with both jammers. Amazing. My, my point of view, but then, it is a lot of communication there. Yeah, and then just another note, um, I agree with Jens, it is super unlikely that they ever pass hips immediately at the exact same time, but there is one case where both jammers immediately become eligible for lead, and that's like if the foremost blocker goes down or out of bounds, um, then they both are, if they're both behind that blocker, then whoever is in front automatically gets lead. Um, so that is one of kind of the weird little edges that I feel is relevant. I, mean, I, yep. uh, I just love having this many officials on the call. It is the best. Um, someone, um, someone has made a comment in the in the chat that says, um, "I am one of those skaters that does the unnecessary hand thing just in case to show I heard and I'm reacting." And I wanted to put it out there that as an official, when I blase or sarcastic about the things that skaters do that aren't in the rule it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it if it makes like for that kind of thing if it makes you feel better but the reason on an official's course i am saying that it's not necessary is because that kind of stuff can then become and i'm back sorry about that um, that kind of, I don't know where I lost it, the, I'll, I'll, I'll edit this all afterwards and no one will know. The reason I'm saying it in an official school, um, if you, I don't remember, if, did, did you hear about the fact that I'm talking about the fact that when skaters do stuff and I'm being like sarcastic about it? Okay. That kind of stuff is great for you to do if you want to do it. The reason I'm saying it in an official school um, and saying really clearly that it's not part of the rule, because when that type of behavior becomes codified, some officials who don't read the book or have just get mis mishear something when they get told something then think it's part of the rules and then punish skaters who don't do that but stand still um so that's why it feels really important to say the things that have become part of the kind of the culture and practice but aren't necessarily essential you shouldn't feel like what you're doing is is uh something to be ashamed of or anything like that um, but it does sometimes make officials laugh but in some ways that's um, unfair um, particularly when you go like that because uh, it's I think it's meant to be like an optimal um, are, are there any other questions I think we've gone through all the questions today 
Um, I think that's it. Do you have any final, any final ones? Um, I think there's one more question. Okay, so thank you to all the amazing people for yep. making this um, wonderful. Oh. Yeah, I think there's one kind of, sort of question. Uh, hi, I, I, am I, can you hear me? What's, uh, what's um, so I'm not sure how, uh, how much sense I'm going to make of, uh, from this. It was, uh, it was just something that I was thinking about when we were talking about, uh, the, uh, skater, uh, the, the, the blocker that was on the, um, on the jammer line. Uh, it just made me think about, uh, let's say that we've got a team, uh, that's got one blocker, let's say black team's got one blocker in their, um, uh, in their uh, in the box, and uh, the white jammer is trying to pass uh, pass the rest, but on their current scoring trip, they haven't actually passed anyone, so they haven't earned any not on the track points uh, because they haven't passed anyone yet. the the black uh, the black blocker comes back on the track, but the white jammer now finally breaks through and starts passing all of the rest. They won't earn the point on the on the black blocker that's that's actually now come on the track as soon as they're part of that pack again, right? Does that make sense? I'm gonna be honest, my internet is so bad I missed some of that. If any of the other officials heard it, that would be very helpful. No, okay. Wait, uh, sorry, okay. I read something and got distracted. Um, repeat the end of that one more time, because I had the answer and it went away. Okay, uh, so we've got the the three uh, three black blockers. Uh, the the uh, the other black blocker that was in the box is coming back. They had yet to earn that uh, not on the track point. Uh, but now the black blocker is behind them, uh, the white behind the white jammer, but they've re-entered the pack. Uh, and and now the white jammer starts passing everybody else. They do not earn that pass uh, on the on the black blocker that has re-entered the pack. Correct. So is it the question of when does it stop being a not on the track point and start being yeah, just a blocker that's, that's a, behind you? Yes, that's a that's that's a much better way to put it. Thank you. So, and I have haven't wrapped in over a year because of injuries. Um, but so it's been a while. But I believe. If that jammer passes blockers one, two, three, exits the engagement zone, they get that point because they never had the opportunity. If they get uh, okay. that blocker, no, they get that point immediately upon passing the per first one. However, if that black blocker gets released and gains position on the jammer before the jammer starts scoring anything, then they are no longer not on the track point. Yes? Okay. I said not from Dread and Jens earlier, maybe? Okay. Oh, I still have it. Um, yeah, so they will earn that point immediately because that blocker is behind them and we're not on the track at the beginning. That blocker okay. gets position, they have to score it. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Amazing. What a thing. I like how I saw Ratty trying to draw it out. Yeah, that's the thing. Like Visuals are so <laughs> important to like, be able to follow all this stuff, right? Um, and also just like how we write scenarios, like a few of the different scenarios today were written by, by me, but also some by participants. And I think that's also why like video footage and sometimes even some of the um, Facebook groups can come out with such interesting outcomes because you haven't written exactly what happened and it creates this entire dialogue until clarification. But um, I, I think having chats is worthwhile. Um, I will, I will any say, final thing? I will say, because this is a habit, is... Uh, I don't know if you've gone over it in previous, so apologies if you have. If you're going through the WFTDA case books, jot down what the explanation is going through. It will help if you turn them into visuals like Dahlia and Thames been sharing before and using the apparatus you can use to make packs and things. Put it through that. So then it's a little bit more visual if you, instead of reading it, if you learn more by visual and we don't have Derby at the moment, use those. And Brighton. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. Don't don't feel like you need to be able to like visualize like absolutely everything in your mind because that's not how everyone's minds work. Um, so and we'll be going through a little bit about that kind of more next week as well around kind of like what next and how to kind of keep going with with this kind of yeah uh a bit more um and also obviously if anyone has any other questions let us know because last week is i mean not last week next week is uh the last week of uh this uh, kind of a uh, group of sessions um but i think on that note we haven't got any more questions and uh i hope you all have um there was one more in the chat sorry oh, which one yeah. i'm gonna read it sorry i keep i keep missing um... them it just says, which reps are responsible for calling false starts, rear IPR, OPR? Um, Whoever is closest to it, uh, typically, I mean, we don't get them as often now because we are allowed to give the warnings for being out of position. Um, but, you know, typically if you're outside and they're on the outside and then you just kind of like look at your IPR and you're like, I got this. And they're like, cool, you got this. And it's all like just whoever's closest um, just kind of takes care of it. Make eye contact with your fellow officials to ensure that things are happening in a way that we can, we're not all yelling over each other. Um, yeah, just whoever's closest. It's everyone's responsibility. Uh-huh. Everyone's responsibility is a really great way, I think, to end this session. Um, and the things that we've spoken about when it comes to microaggressions, discrimination, overtime jams, lead jammer, um, and actually I think being a ref can hopefully help you think about the things that are everyone's responsibility and other the times when it's best for, um, some people to take the lead responsibility for something. Uh, and on that note, uh, I hope you have a, a good week, uh, continue to be kind of, you know, officially awesome as we're now saying more. Um, and, uh, yeah, see you all next week. Bye. Thank you.